There we go. Welcome to another episode of Spilling Ink, the talk show that takes you behind the book to meet the authors and professionals in the publishing industry. We are back with our Christmas episode. It's one week till Christmas. Actually, not even one week. It's like three days till Christmas when we're recording this. So for all of our viewers out there, Merry Christmas. And if we don't catch you beforehand, Happy New Year. And as always, I'm here with my co-host, Jason. How are we doing, Jason? Doing great tonight. Merry Christmas, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the holiday season. I can't believe how fast this holiday season came on us. Yeah, I hope you're done with your shopping because it's it's go time now. Yeah, I'm I'm done, but I don't feel done. <laughs> who, do, who do we have with us tonight? And we've got Paul Atreides with us. Did I say it right, Paul? That's close enough. Close enough. I always screw up names. <laughs> I do. It's it's terrible. Feel free to screw mine up. <laughs> Salad ass, right? That's right, salad ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then to that I say, if I ate more salad, I'd have less ass. So, you know, it works. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I eat like one salad a month and I don't see any difference. I, it just doesn't seem to make a difference for me. <laughs> I, I have weekly little pre-packed salads I make and yeah, it doesn't make a difference. So, Katie, I have yep. to say... You look very nice tonight. Oh, well, thank you. You're thank doing, you. I'm wearing I like my Darth Vader tonight. I, I am absolutely in love with that hoodie. It's awesome. <laughs> very, very cool. Have you gone out and seen the new movie yet? I, I did. I went out and I saw Star Wars. That's why I'm wearing my, my Darth Vader today. It's in Was honor it of Star Wars. And uh, I... Don't spoil I, anything. I'm not going to spoil it. I see what the... I see what the screenwriters are doing. I understand why they're doing it. I wish they hadn't gone a certain direction, but I can appreciate why they're trying to do it. Okay. And, and ultimately, it's they're trying to bring the new fans in, into the fold, and they don't want to tell the same old story that we're used to. They want to expand on it with newer, younger protagonists. Okay. Well, they have to. I mean, well, they have to. Yeah. You know, I mean, they killed off Han, one. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Eric Carey left the planet for us, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to bring in the new characters. I, mm -hmm. they, I don't think they had ch had a choice. Well, now overall, did you did you did you like it or did you dislike it, Katie? Um, for about say seventy five percent of the story, I really enjoyed it. They okay. did have one meandering plot line that was completely pointless because they needed to give characters something to do. Okay, and I felt like that could have been cut, and the story wouldn't have hurt at all for it. Okay. Yeah. See, and I have completely avoided any kind of comments from anyone on it because I don't want, I don't want spoilers and you know on stuff. Um, but okay, in interesting, and I and I do know that I've been seeing lots of smiley faces and lots of frowny faces when it when it comes to it. So go in um, with your with no expectations. Go in to enjoy it, and then make your determination after. Me personally, I would like to go see it again because the second time you watch something, you always catch more than you you see in the first go. Yeah. yeah. Yep, for sure. Cool. Are you like a, a real film buff kind of person? Me? No. My husband is, though. Oh, so... He, like, that's, that was his major in college. <laughs> he studied oh. film. So every year over at the AMC in Town Square, they do the best picture show. And we spend two Saturdays before the Academy Awards watching all the nominated films. Wow. Uh, and then we come out of each one and we discuss it and whatnot. And then we watch the, the Academy Awards. And it's been real interesting for me because just like you were saying about, you thought that there were pieces that could, could have been cut. That's how I've been judging which film I think should win best picture is is there any wasted film? Are there any wasted frames in a film? And so, and we do our own little competition, you know, while we watch. Every year I've only been off on the awards by one. Oh, wow. And best film. <laughs> See, so. That's and, interesting. But that applies to the writing too. You know, is there stuff in the book? Is there stuff in the chapter that really doesn't need to be there? 
and and that's something that uh, actually I'd love to expand on that a little bit and and, and do it on air, um, talking about how editing and how uh, snipping out scenes that we may not need um, actually makes the story stronger. And, yeah. you know, it's difficult to do because there's a lot of times where we write a story and we feel this this information has to be given to the audience or the reader. And ultimately, if it's not pushing the plot forward or it's not interesting, it's got to get cut and you've got to find a better way to tell it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. This book that I've been working on, this novel I've been working on for going on six years now, <laughs> um, part one, I have the protagonist working in a bar under an assumed name. And he's been there for a couple of years now and he's established like this, like this mother son relationship with this woman that owns the bar. And I thought I had this scene in there that was just beautiful and perfect and so well written. And every critique group that I belong to came back after that chapter and said, you have to cut this out. Hmm. <laughs> that sucks. That uh, really stings. But, <laughs> you know, as you go, but as you go back through, you know, if, if you take that whole first part of the book and you read through the entire thing, you go, yeah, they were right. <laughs> it had to go. It really didn't do anything for the for the story arc. Hmm. And it's a bummer because it's always those those passages that you really kind of put some put some real heart into and that you're proud of, and then you realize, oh crap, well, not yeah, necessary. It, and it's always, for some reason, it always seems to be the ones that when you sit down at the computer, it just flows. Yeah. It just flows right out. <laughs> And then somebody comes along and kicks you in the ass. <laughs> yep. Those make yep. for good little teasers and stuff to uh, to use in marketing to share with your your real fans. If it's like a series, yeah, you um, know that's a good idea, Katie. Yeah, yeah I had well, when we were posting the uh, was it the first seven lines that were going around a couple weeks ago. Oh yeah. yeah. One of my readers who's read the book that uh, um, that I'm querying out right now. And she knows the storyline and I had posted the first seven lines of the next book, the one I'm currently working on. And she immediately asked, well, where's the scene between Sage and her roommate where she unloads her secret on him? And I thought, you know, it wasn't that interesting. I mean, as, as informative as it was, it wasn't that interesting to open up a story with. So it's going to be used as a teaser when it comes to the marketing. Okay. Right. Okay. Excellent. I like it. It's funny as I remember reading that comment. When she when she wrote that, I was like, "Oh, that's a good point." <laughs> yeah, as much as I would have loved to have put it in the story, to open with it would have been such a boring way to open a book. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> have yeah. you ever had to take like an entire chapter and move it? Yes. I have. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? That and and that can be really jarring for the whole freaking story. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I had that uh, with um, Pathosis and Deranged. I don't think you read either of those, those Katie, because they had spiders in them. Um, no, I read Pathosis. I didn't get to read Deranged yet. Okay. Okay. Well, I, those those ones all, I, I had kind of scripted them out with a scene chart. And so what I would do is I would, I would move the chapters around where I thought that they would have the best flow in the story. And that was, that was something I'll never do again. That was terrible. Oh. But yeah. So you yeah. like, like plot everything out are you a plotter i i am not a plotter but so so here's what i did is i i didn't i didn't actually plot the whole thing i just kind of like katie katie writes to-do lists and i had this idea of you know 40 or so scenes that i knew would be cool to have in this book so i just jotted the the, the headline for the scene down you know you know karen goes here or spiders attack this person and uh and so as I'm writing them, you know, I'm, I'm writing them as they're written on this list. And then I just kind of jigsaw puzzle them to, together where I thought they were going to work the best. So it was, it was strange. Uh, yeah, it was strange. <laughs> Jason, I sent you the, uh, the to-do list after I talked to you yesterday. Did you get a chance to look at that? I actually just finished, finished reading it about 20 minutes ago. I, I was at work all day, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to read it. And it was really long. Um, Sorry. So, 
<laughs> it was like a chapter by chapter to do list. <laughs> it, it was. So so I like the I like the to do list. I like where you went with it. Um, I feel like there's there's some more little details that need to be addressed as far as specifics on how the amulet works and, and things like that, but I can see that the to do list is just kind of a, a rough thing where you're you need your points and, and so that you can go back and hit them. But right, I, I think right. I think it's good and I like where you go with the ending, although you know what? I don't like it in these younger adult books and not not saying young adult because i know you said it's not younger young adult but younger new adult books where in the end even when the protagonist does it right it's like people are still upset with him for it yeah and but like, i have to have it that way because she's not supposed to reveal the secret know, that the whole but... first book is about the fact that she's now become the guardian of and this magical talisman, and now she's using like, it in book two. She's not guarding it. You get props for that. Like, don't give me shit. I saved the world, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyhow, that's that's my that's my take. I always feel like the protagonist gets kind of crapped on by her peers, and I know so that like, that's conflict, but. What if she gets crapped on by Ava, but she gets props from Grey, who is usually very antagonistic to her? Well, see, I feel like that's a good thing, since e earlier in the story, you mentioned that you wanted Grey to show a little jealousy when when someone else was hitting on her. Who was hitting on her? The vampire, Zach. The, va the vampire, okay. So I think that they'd be, they'd be good, you know, just kind of like a, hey, you, you kicked ass there kind of thing. And then third book, that's when the uh, when the cheap electronic music starts up, and they you know they're falling into sweet sweet loving. I, you know, and I wasn't gonna do a romantic angle, but I had two different readers, both fangirl over one of the male characters, and it was a different male character with each reader that came to me. And I thought, okay, well, I guess I could I could play the the triangle angle without having it be heavy in the story. Just to keep some of the the ladies happy. Now, so, I so have that stuff though. For some reason, I don't know why, but for some reason, it seems like there always has to be some romantic angle in a in a book. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure, for sure, and I and I think definitely based on who you're you're targeting here, which is you know seventeen to twenty five year old women. I I think that they they like to have a little bit of romantic element. But one thing I don't agree with is the stupid freaking love triangle. I hate the love triangle so much. And I understand that it's really popular and people love the love the love triangle. I I don't know, I just can't stand it. I feel I always feel like someone's being betrayed. Like, you know, the I I suppose the, the biggest one in recent years with for um, that was popular was the whole Twilight thing, you know. Poor Jacob. You have gotten over Jacob, have you? Well, you know what I don't I don't like the love triangle because if you're committed to someone, you're not supposed to be screwing around with somebody else. Even if it's just emotional flirting, you're still cheating. That's not okay with me. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. wow. Not even a tiny attraction? Not even a tiny bit. No. Oh, as as you, area. you feel that attraction, you're supposed to take your belt off and whip yourself with it. <laughs> to purify your soul. Like the monks of old. That's right. <laughs> uh, so, Paul, tell me about what what you write. It, it seems like you and Katie have a have a relationship already, but this is my first time talking to you. So, tell tell me a little bit about what you do. Oh, um, well, um, my three traditionally published books are paranormal. They lean toward humor. Um, okay, about ghosts. And they take place in the in the present day. What is it like for them on the other side? You know, um, what can what can they not do? Do they still want relationships and that kind of thing? So the reason I asked you about moving chapters is because the, my very first book in this series, I had the editor. Well, let let me back up. I was I originally self published the book. And I had book one and book two self-published. And I was at a conference and they did a first page read kind of thing. And it got pulled and read. And 
the publisher, acquisition agent, editor looked out over the crowd and said, I don't know who wrote this, but I want it. So that's how the books got picked up by a publisher. <laughs> wow, that's that's freaking awesome. <laughs> so we're working on book one, and she said, you know, it really kind of starts out a little boring. I really don't care about, you know, I, yeah, I care, but it doesn't grab me. Your chapter two really grabs me. So okay. I had to move chapter two up and make it chapter one and then find a way to seek into it. And so the way the book opens up is that uh, the protagonist, Marvin, has been in an argument with his wife, or not wife, his fiance. He runs out of the townhouse, steps into the street and gets hit by a bus and dies. So that's how the book opens. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's different. That's that's definitely an opening that'll grab you, though. Well, I yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then he spends the rest of the book trying to kill her. The the woman who hit him, or his, he tries to. Oh. He spends the rest of the book trying to kill his fiance. Holy crap! But you said this is funny, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's kind of like if you take the film Ghost and mm -hmm. mash it up with the film The Hangover. Oh, okay. So, I like it. More, more of a dark comp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So is there more to the ghost world then than haunting a person? Like, do they have their own whole society? Oh, yes, they do. Oh, yes, they do. And they have their own rules. There are rules over on that side. And, uh, and that's what gets him into trouble is because he keeps on trying to kill her. And so they have to convince him this is not a good idea. And uh, without giving away the end of book one, she does die. <laughs> yeah. But we can't say how. Okay. And then book two, which is called Jenna's Gang of Deadheads, they spend trying to decide if they're actually going to go through with a wedding. And ha can dead people actually get married? <laughs> oh, okay. So. And, and what is book three? I, I see you've got a poster up behind you. What's the title? Yeah, uh, book three is Nathan's Clan of Deadheads, and each each one gets a little darker. And they all kind of touch on domestic violence and domestic abuse, but book three kind of goes into it a little bit more. And Nathan owns a vast amount of property in West Virginia, and he and other people who possess live people that's where they hang out and live. And through the course of the book, he gets forced into, because of course, taking over live people is a big no-no in the dead world. He gets forced <laughs> into using some of his fortune to build a shelter for women and children and, and men. This seems like a really kind of off the wall series here. What, what inspired this? How, where'd the idea come from? Oh boy, you know, I wish I knew exactly where the idea came from i i actually I, it's going to sound very odd very weird but i actually do talk to and hear dead people <laughs> Ooh, really yes yes i do awesome. and so i just you know i sat down on the computer one day and i said well you know what would happen if somebody was killed you know, and they're young and they had the rest of their lives ahead of them, how are they going to handle that? You know, how are they going to handle that anger, that disappointment? That's where it came from. Now, do they move on at some point to another realm once they've done their unfinished business or spent enough time on, on this plane? They yeah, do, they live out, do they live out what would have been the rest of their natural life in, in a certain plane and then go? No, actually in book two, we have Eleanor of Aquitaine and Henry. They show up, Versace shows up to okay. design her wedding gown. <laughs> no, I, they, they can hang around for centuries as long as they have led a good life. If they've been awful, kind of like, uh, let's say, a, a John Wayne Gacy or a, a oh, Hitler. John. You know, then there's there's a person, there are people that envelop them and never let them out, never free them. 
And it's a very dark, awful, god awful place to be. Opposite, of course, is available to the very young who, let's say, they die of illness or they get killed in, you know, by a freak accident or something. Or the very old who say, no, they're just tired of being in the world and they're ready to go. The guy that envelops the bad people, his name is Jason. The woman who takes the good people, her name is Teresa. And that's all voluntary. I mean, you go with her or not. It's kind of, I guess, you know, shows a, a bit of the good and evil of the world. So I'm, I'm curious because it sounds like there's a there's an ethical system in place here. Is it a religious based system? You know, are there are there you know sins and and things like that, or or is it mostly? Yeah, how how is it how is it set up? How are these determinations on if you were good or bad? How are they made? They're just basic rules. One is you do not interfere with the living. You may kill them. You may not hurt them. And uh, that, that is like the biggest rule there is. So then, of course, now when we get to book three, you know, that'll be out January 24th, we find out that possessing people is a big no-no. But there are exceptions, you know, exceptions can be made. And it's all controlled by the World Council of Keepers. Okay. And they're kind of the, the higher powers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I, I like it. it. It sounds really cool. Now, now you said that these are traditionally published. Is that correct? They are now. Yes. Okay. Who is your publisher? If uh, Wild Rose Press. Wild Rose. Yeah. Okay. Are are they a, a smaller press or are they a larger publisher? Or? They're they're rather a medium sized press now. They are now. I think that going in there, they are into their eleventh year of publishing. Okay. They focused the first eight years, I think they focused on nothing but romance and erotica. And then for some reason, I don't know why, I guess they felt that they were making enough money that they could venture out to mainstream. And so they started picking up mainstream stuff, of okay. which I guess they consider mine mainstream because it's not really romance. Okay. And it's really not erotica. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, it doesn't say water porn. <laughs> so what what have you done in your life leading up to this have you always dabbled in writing or or where what have your careers been oh no i was in civil engineering for over 30 years and as a well off and on avocation vocation i was an actor and director and producer in theater oh cool um, and did that for well over 30 years. I just gave that up a short while ago. But when the crash came uh, in 2007, 2008, my engineering employer decided they were going to let me go, so they did. Three weeks later, they brought me back on as a consultant mm. and kept me as a consultant until May of 2011. And when they cut me in 2011, I said, now what do I do? I, how, what do I do with my time? You know, and besides trying to find another job, which was impossible, you know, falling in that age bracket of, you know, too old to hire and too young to retire, you know. Mm -hmm. So, well, what am I going to do? So I sat down at the computer and just started writing just to amuse myself and fill time. And uh, I had the, the critic for the newspaper in town asked me to read a piece of my writing. So I gave it to him. He liked it. I wrote a play, he came to review the play and gave it a good review. And then he had a friend who had a monthly magazine. And so he told this friend, you need to start doing a column on theater and you need to hire this guy. So they'd me and so I did that for eight months. And then the man, this man who set all this up for me, this theater critic, got very ill and passed away. Oh. And the newspaper came to me and asked if I would be a theater critic for them. So I did that until Nathan Adelson bought the newspaper. <laughs> and so <laughs> got the old boot again. <laughs> and so now I, I'm a theater critic for Eat More Art Vegas. Very cool. Okay, so you've, you, you've kind of had a, a long history in the creative arts, you know, at least enjoying them. Yes. That's yes. a good thing, and yeah. you were you were acting in you know the 
I'm, I don't know a whole lot about theater. When you when you say theater, are you talking about broad? Are you talking about plays or musicals or a little bit of everything? Yeah, plays and musicals. Yes. Okay. okay. And I was a god awful actor. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit it. I was god awful. That was what I was going to ask: is were you were you really good? <laughs> <laughs> I was god awful at it. Um, do you, do but, you want to do a uh, an on the spot uh, King Lear? <laughs> oh, good lord, no! <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I discovered that I didn't like it well enough to try and hit Broadway. I toured for six months with a show, with a musical, and said, "Oh my God, I can't do this anymore." Um, so I started working for small companies who do like a three or four week run and it's over <laughs> and uh, started directing and really enjoyed that and and did some good stuff. I did some good work as a director. Well, that's cool. That's and I think it informs my writing. I think it does. You know, people say they like my dialogue, but I think my dialogue sucks. <laughs> Dialogue is absolutely crucial. In fact, when I when I write my first drafts, it's almost always just dialogue. Me too. I swear to God. Yes. You yes. hear the, the voices and you're basically just copying down what they're saying and then if you add in the scenery and what they're doing and the feelings and the you know the stage directions after that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, somebody that gets me. <laughs> 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 yeah, too funny. See, well, what I about you, Jason? How do you do it? Yes, I say I don't. I don't see it that way at all. You know, when I when I see something, when things are are flowing, you know, it's more like more like I'm kind of watching the movie in my head and trying to write down what I'm seeing in the in the movie. So I, I it's it's everything, and I've and I've got to try to capture it all right then because then when I when I go back through to try to make a second pass, I never. I never have as strong a, a connection to it again, and it's really frustrating because, you know, I, I hear people talk about being able to really, you know, embellish certain things and expand on certain things when they do their revision pass, and I'm like, man, revisions to me, I'm I'm always I'm stripping stuff out, I'm cutting stuff out, and I, I never feel like I'm as connected as that first really exciting moment that I live that scene. So, I wish that's something I think I've got to learn, is how to how to get back in that moment. Cause I think it'll make me a lot stronger if I could, if I could do that. Well, you know, it really takes all kinds. I mean, your way is not wrong. My way is not wrong. It's however you can actually get the scene written. Now, as far as the, the revisions go, I find for me that when I'm writing, I just dump everything on the page. When right. it comes to revisions, I really have to focus and say, give myself a goal of only working on one specific chapter per night so that I can really give that chapter 100% attention and really let myself take the time to see the scene. Hmm. Wow. No, I can't, I can't do that. I can't do that. If I know a sentence sucks or a paragraph sucks, I have to stop and fix it right then and there. <laughs> I can <laughs> dump it. <laughs> but you know what helps me, Jason, in, in revisions? What's that? Is going back to it, to the chapter before the one I'm, I want to work on or think okay. I can work on. I go back and I read it. Get back in the zone. You get back into the zone, yeah. And 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 it seems to help me with revisions. It doesn't help me get it, get the first draft down, but <laughs> well, it's funny. I'll go through those periods where, you know, when you when you really get in the zone and you're writing really fast, then I'll go back and look, and it's all just one big long block paragraph that I know I'm going to have to really heavily revise, but. It's when I'm trying to force myself to write, when I'm not really feeling it, that I'll go back and I'll fix every sentence. And it's like, what am I doing? I'm just, I'm wasting time here when I need to get more words out. And, uh, it just, just the other day, and I, and I don't have much time to write anymore right now, but the other day I was writing and I had gotten almost a thousand words done and I'm looking back through it. I'm like, oh my God, this was all just poop. It was all terrible. <laughs> I'm like... I didn't. I can tell that I didn't want to be writing right then. I could tell my heart wasn't into it because I'm like, it's just, it's not interesting enough. Yeah. So I don't know. Are you able to get up and walk away and and come back a little while later, or do you just? Well, you know, I 
invariably I will come back to it later because I, I get frustrated about it. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to get this done. And so I'll keep hacking at it and keep hacking at it until I, I finally get something where I'm like, okay, now I can be satisfied for the day. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, so some weeks it's it's not a whole lot. You know, it's been the holiday season is super busy. I said the problem too with trying to find time to write, Jason. I know you're extremely busy, and uh, you know I can put all the excuses out there of why I haven't been writing as much as possible. But lately, I haven't gotten any quiet time to hear myself think, so that makes it hard to write. Coming mm -hmm. back and and you know going over what you've written almost seems like. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. You make every excuse in the book just so that you can keep pushing forward. And every time you sit down, you're like, let me just get a thousand words in. I'll look yeah. at this later. I don't care if it's crap. Let me just get a thousand words in. Otherwise, I'll never get the story written. Yeah. Well, and Katie, you are a, you're a freaking workhorse. I, I know the kind of word counts you, pro, you produce in the year and it's, and mine pale in comparison. And I, I don't know. I, I I look at authors like you who can who can really put their nose to the grindstone, and I'm and I'm envious because I I wish I had that kind of work ethic and really could discipline myself like you can. But I don't know. It's it's tough. Like you you tend to to take all the the crazy in your life and and then still be able to find time to focus. Whereas me, the crazy gets started, and I'm just like, oh, I'm lost. What do I do? I'm I'm useless. <laughs> Yeah, but that's also looking at my crazy going into two or three in the morning before I'm going to bed and then waking up at 6 a.m. again yeah. with the kids. So I'm, I'm constantly that's, running on fumes. That's okay, nice. so, so how long does it take to, to start to finish? Katie, it's like six hours. What's that? <laughs> it's like six hours for Katie. For a book? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Lately, it's been really bad. Um, I try and set myself a goal of a thousand words a day. Whether they're good words or not, a thousand words a day, and um, I was averaging 70? one book uh, written, edited, and revised every four months. Wow! Oh my God, that puts my two years to shame. But <laughs> but crazy. lately, the last two books have taken me twice as long. I, I haven't been able to focus nearly as much as I wanted to, and and when you compare me to say those right to market people that are just churning out books, I'm so envious of how fast they can put them out. They're putting out a new book almost every 60 days. Well, yeah, and you know what? Ronnie um, Verdi was on here and he was talking about that. And I was like, you've got to be you've got to be shitting me. How how in the hell do you write that many words in that amount of time? I mean, never mind if you like if I quit my job today and ran away from my family and holed up in a hotel and tried to work write an entire novel in 60 days, I still don't think I'd be able to. Oh, no. I've only got I've only got so much creativity at a time. I gotta yeah. I've gotta space it out. Well, but then how do you work in getting it critiqued? How do you work in getting it edited? How do you work in beta readers? How do you? I mean, all that takes time. How do they manage to do it in thirty I days? Don't, I don't so, I don't think they're doing it. I think they're just they're they're going with whatever's hot and slamming it up there, aren't they, Katie? Well, yes and no. They they are slamming it out really quickly, and they usually have editors that work fast. They're not doing multi-level editing, though. Mm -hmm. um, what they're doing is they're using their their initial readers as their beta readers, and when somebody says, hey, this needs fixed, they compile it all and fix it after the fact. Wow. So they're still pushing it out there really quickly, and they're getting it to where it's 80% perfect, I think is what their rule is. Yeah. And once they get it to 80%, they're like, yep, set it out there. We'll fix it as needed. And then move on to the next one. And oh, because no. they're churning it out so fast, they're keeping the readers happy because readers don't have patience. Yeah, that's you true. Know, it's, it's just like Netflix ruined us with, with binge watching. We have no patience for series anymore. We want to watch it all in one go. Yep. I got a one-star review on Marvin's World of Deadheads because at the end of the book, we put a teaser for book two and it took almost another eight months to get book two published and so this person came in and did this one star review of marvin because she saw this teaser for book two and it still wasn't out yet <laughs> but look about five years ago and that was the norm i mean i look at some of the mercy thompson books that i've you know read years ago that i loved and they have the teaser for the next book, and it's a year or better before you get the next book, and that was okay then. 
Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, look how long it takes George Martin to get a book out. Oh, I know. Is he going to actually put one out in 2018? Oh, he claims, but... Well, he's been putting out all the side work. Yeah, I'm, I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> <laughs> we are. Although I can't really say anything. I'm still on book two. It takes me forever to read his books. <laughs> yeah. we, we are an on-demand culture now. We, we want everything exactly at the moment it pops into our head, I think. And, oh, we do. We do. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't that's know. the reason why with the next series that I'm writing... I said, if I don't get any agent bites on book one that I'm querying, by the time I have written book three, because I have it planned to be a trilogy, then I will just send it to my personal editor and I will release them one month at a time. Boom, boom, boom. Wow. See, now maybe that's a good way to do it too. Get them all ready. Right. I mean, that way I've got the best of both worlds. I'm still attempting to reach the traditional marketplace, but if I'm not getting anything within, you know, let's say six to eight months, Maybe it's time to just go ahead and do it myself. Yeah. Well, and I'm, you know, Katie, you know that I'm, I'm re-releasing three books because they were picked up by that publisher, and they they only want thrillers, and I'm I'm on the hook with them for five books total. So what I'm what I've now begun thinking is that, so this this coming September, we're going to release one book, and then roughly a month after the the second book and then roughly a month after the third book but right now i'm i'm starting to write another one that i'm a little ways into and i'd like to have it to where within a couple months of those first three releases that they can have another one to to try to get out so that if it's going well see if that whole put them out right away and and sell the series thing that actually works for me because i don't know i've never i'm a i'm a book a year um, you know, that's that's about as much as I can write, but you know, it, it seems like <laughs> that's just not cutting it. So I've gotta gotta up my game somehow. So I'm gonna see if that I'm gonna see if that works this year. Hopefully it does and that'll be good. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the way it used to be for authors. You know, you look at a lot of the traditional actually it still is for some of the traditional published authors. The one book a year is what they're contracted for, it's what the readers expect from them, and that's yeah. okay. But yeah. from the indie marketplace, we've trained our readers, I guess, to expect the Netflix style system of putting books out quickly, having series done, you know, not one year at a time, not even six months at a time, but yeah. every 90 days for some. Oh. Yeah, that's, yeah. And there's, there's no, there's no turning back, I don't think. <laughs> I mean, we can't, that's not a trend that's ever going to stop, you know, and especially if I watch the way my, my kids consume me media and, and what they like, you know, it's like, if it's not right there at their fingertip right then, it's out of their mind, it's done. Well, and, and that's not to, to put doom and gloom out there for any authors who are listening, um, that you have to write that fast. If you build an organic fan base, you will have readers who will patiently wait for your next book, especially if you're active on social media and you're, you know, offering teasers or you're telling your readers where you're at. You know, if you're, if you're open with them, they will wait for that next book and they'll be excited when that next book comes out. But a lot of people right now are kind of leaning towards that, get them out quicker. Yes, well, you need, you need real fans and real fans, real good readers. Um, you know, Katie, Katie knows I love this guy um, because her and some other friends went and picked up this book for me at Phoenix Comic Con. It's a uh, Red Rising but by Pierce Brown and I read this book and was so captivated by it that I patiently waited a year for the second and then a year for the next. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to con continue to read these, you know, it's, it's, it's not something I'm going to stop just because I had to wait for a little while. Um, but I think it's just, if the readers love it enough, they're going to do that. So you've got to create something that they, they just really, really love. And maybe it, it has something to do with uh, the readers you're targeting as well. If, you know, if you're targeting young adult readers, you know, who are, are living a little bit faster paced lifestyle, you, you may need to produce faster than you would if you're, if you're writing um, for adults, but I don't know. I don't know. Well, I think that's also where the, the social media aspect comes in too reaching your readers and actually working with them, interacting with them helps them be, patient or or helps amp that excitement up when you do get closer to putting the next book out 
I don't know. I wonder if that's behind the the recent push for shorter chapters too. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm I'm feeling that. You yeah. know, I get this pushback. You know, well, the chapter's too long. The chapter's too long. You need to shorten this chapter. Yeah. And and I think maybe this whole thing is behind that too. Yeah. Now, when you're saying shorter chapters, what average word count are you per chapter? Oh gosh, I couldn't even tell you word count. I could just like go by pages, you know, like, no, if, if it's like more than five or six pages long, no, no, the chapter's too long, you need to cut it back. Wow. Come out and push it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I completely agree with that, Paul. And I, and I, I've been as part of my research for working with this new publisher, I'm reading a lot more mainstream fiction and, um, and I, and I've, I've noticed that everything is super short chapters. Just, yeah. just a couple of pages long, and I remember as a kid um, reading fantasy books. You know, it was always my you know mom or dad would always say, "Okay, you know, you can finish that chapter, then it's then it's bedtime." Because you know, we figure a chapter is going to be a good ten to twenty pages. That's a reasonable amount of time for you know kid to get to bed. But yeah. now it's like, okay, that chapter was three and a half pages long. Now I'm boom onto another POV. Yeah. Have you have you picked up? And looked at even looked at Stephen King's with his son, The Sleeping Beauties. I haven't. I haven't. I picked it up and I, I finished it, <coughs> but it's broken up into parts. The parts are broken up into chapters, and the chapters aren't that long, but the chapters are even broken down into parts. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Why that's, are they compartmentalizing so much? Oh my I mean, gosh. Isn't a chapter supposed to be, you know, a, its own unique story goal? You know, it's supposed to add to the overall arc, but it's supposed to yeah. be its own, you know, mini story. Yeah. Yeah. But hmm. open up one of the, open up the book and one of his chapters might have 10 or 11 parts to it. Okay. And a part might be two pages long. It might be a single paragraph long. Well, here's my question for you. Aside from it being different, how did you feel the book read being broken up into that many parts? Do you feel like it added anything or took anything away from it? Didn't take anything away from it. Okay. Um, I think it helped keep characters straight. Okay. Okay. Well, see, that's interesting. You know, if it's, if it's not impacting it in a negative way and... I have a lot of respect for Stephen King. He's one of my one of my idols, uh, fantastic author. So I mean, maybe that's something to to look at and, and take stock of. Is that part of the instant gratification thing? You know, con you know, congratulations, you made it to another chapter. See, I think so. That's I mean, that's that's what I'm thinking in the back of my mind anyway. Mm -hmm. I know I'm certainly trying to to shorten all my chapters up with with what I'm writing now. I'm in. Instead of, you know, just a, a little bit of a break and going into something else, it's boom, just new chapter. And so, yeah, but I think you're right. I think it is an instant gratification thing. That's you know. weird. See, I, I have a minimum that I will do word count wise per chapter. Really? And I try not to let it fall below that, that word count, but I don't have a maximum. So what's your, what's your minimum word count for a chapter? So I, I like to keep the uh, the word count at a minimum of a thousand words per chapter because I feel like that gives you enough to get a couple pages in, yeah. but it also gives you enough to tell that mini story that you're supposed to be telling. Now, as far as the maximum goes, I don't have a maximum. It's however long that chapter needs to be to tell that specific part of the story. See, and I agree with that. I agree with that. It just It needs to be as long as it needs to be. Yeah. And um, I think a thousand words is is a really good minimum because that's also a reasonable amount of amount of words to sit down and write at one time as well. So you can kind of get all of that out at once. And and that's where that came from because my my goal per night is a thousand words. And usually when I sit down to write, I'll have a scene in mind and I want to just get that scene written. So yeah. if I get the scene written and I hit my thousand words, great, I've hit all my goals for the night. Well, I've actually got chapters in, in my published books that are like three quarters of a page. <laughs> now, artistically done, I've seen that work really well. I mean, Jason, you talk about the, the Twilight books, but uh, in, I think it was the second one, where there's four or five different pages that are just, 
the name of the month to yeah. you know to show the passing of time and how desolate it was and i thought artistically that's beautifully done yeah i thought so too i don't even remember that now i remember hating the second book an incredible amount and yeah. that was probably why <laughs> when, it's when edward disappears when edward disappears on it Oh my God! Well, and you know why? Because that second book was just all about love triangle. Yes. And yes. you know, I don't. It was. It was just. It was. It was too much. It was too much emotion and not enough action for me. But uh, yeah. yeah. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So you've got you've got three books published, and has the has the book three been published yet or is that in the wings still it's gonna it will be released on january 24th oh oh okay that is right around the corner yeah okay yeah so what are you doing as far as a release go you know how how do you set that up working with your publisher um well they will be sending it out to reviewers i send it out to reviewers that i can find you know that are willing to to read it and, and publish something about it. Mm -hmm. um, I did a launch party for book one, uh, but life got in the way and there was no way that I could do one for book two. So I'll probably go back to doing a launch party. Now, when you do a launch party, are you doing online? Or are you doing it at a location like a, a Barnes and Noble or the library? Uh, see, and, and, and I've done the book signings at Barnes and Noble and you don't get very many sales out of that. Um, so I think I'm going to kind of bag that. And the launch party that I did for book one, I did here at my house. And I lured people in with food. <laughs> hey, that's how, really you, that's well. how you get you there, right there. <laughs> that Give me a bunch of <laughs> Backyard barbecue and book sales. See, <laughs> I like that. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> now, here comes a question that I've always wondered because I've yet to work with a publisher. And as an indie, you know, we go through either Create Space or Lightning, and we have to order our books wholesale. For events like that, when you go to, say, a Comic-Con, when you go to a library convention where you have to provide your own books, how do you do that going through your publisher? Are you still paying wholesale cost? Yeah. Are they taking it out of royalties? How does that work? Well, is it, well with this publisher, anyway, it's, it's kind of interesting. They make you pay for the books. You have to buy the books. Um, Full price. But the, no, it's, it's like there's an author's discount. So okay. getting like a severe discount. Um, for instance, I, the the new book I think is going to retail for fifteen ninety five, but at my author price drops it down to like four something. But then they pay me royalties on that. Yeah, that should still show up as a sale if they had to purchase yeah. it too. Yeah. So I, it's kind of interesting, but yeah. So now, how often and and how easy is it to order books from your publishers? Oh, it's a breeze. I mean, it really is a breeze. I get online, I go to the author page, I want this many, and usually within seven days, I've got them. That's not bad at all. Yeah, not, not at all. Who do they use for printing, do you know? I don't know the company they use for printing, I just know that in a newsletter they sent out to their authors, they were bragging that their printer the company they use to print their books is only like five blocks from them. Hmm. And she, the, the president of the, of the organization, who, by the way, is going to be on faculty for the, for the Writers' Conference in 2018, goes over and inspe actually inspects the print every oh. few days. Now, you mentioned the, the Writers' Conference. Is that the one that happens in April? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've and been we meaning to go to that one. I miss it every year. <laughs> oh. Well, I got to tell you what, I, I, I was the coordinator for the past two years and passed the torch for 2018. It's been moved from Samstown to the Tuscany, okay. which is a whole lot better. Uh, the facility is better. Uh, people are really going to like it because when you go to the Tuscany, 
to get to the convention space, you go through the hotel lobby. And so there's like zero smoking at all on that side of the property. Um, so that's going to make a lot of people happy with just, just that alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's closer to the strip now. So I don't know if that's necessarily a benefit and, and us locals, we, we know going to the strip is a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I prefer off strip whenever possible. Uh, me too. <laughs> but we've got, to, I, to, uh, what is it? The downtown festival. I oh. always read having to go downtown for the uh, Vegas Valley book festival. Oh yeah. 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 I don't like it at all. <laughs> I mean, it's a great festival. Don't get me wrong, but it's just that anything having to do with going towards touristy spots. <sighs> yeah. yeah. It's, you gotta find a place to park and then you have to walk and yeah. Fighting crowds. Yeah. Fighting traffic and downtown's terrible because of all the one way streets. Yeah. Drudgery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you're having to lug books behind you. Oh, I know. I actually lucked out this year that I did not get a booth. I, I was kind of happy that that worked out the way it did because then I didn't really have to bring my whole setup. And, and when I set up for book signings, I set up. I mean, I've got, you know, table stuff. I've got wire racks. I've got books and bookmarks and swag of all kinds. And uh, I really, you know, go the distance to make it look good. But that's a lot of stuff to cart around, especially yeah. when parking is an issue. <laughs> yeah set it all up and then you got to break it all down and haul it all out. Exactly. I'm actually, um, the, the Paseo Verde library here in Henderson contacted me recently and asked if I would do a talk on setting up and manning a, a book signing and how to have a successful signing talking about things like what to bring, how to interact with people, what to prepare for. So I'm really excited. I'll be doing that in February over at that library. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Although when you go to like Barnes and Noble for a signing, they don't give you very much room. <laughs> no, but depending on the Barnes and Noble you go to out here, um, they can be really nice. I know the uh, that big nook sign right in front as you walk in. Yeah. The last yeah. time I went, they had my books straight up that sign so that you could see them bright and clear as you walked right in. Yeah. It, it looked good. The presentation was well. Yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. And then you're kind of like right off to the side of the of the door. And unfortunately, they give you this tiny little table. <laughs> You're like the Walmart greeter. <laughs> Hi, would you like a bookmark? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah it's, it's fun. Great. I like doing a lot of the multi-author signings too. Those, those can be fun because you get to, a chance to interact with the other authors. Actually, I think it's a lot more fun. Yes. Do you have, do you get more book sales that way? Do you think? No, I don't think I get more book sales, but a lot of this industry is, is the connections you make. Yeah. And you know, while you may not get a lot of sales, sometimes making a friend with another author opens up another opportunity to join in another signing, to join in an anthology. Yeah. So I find that those are really good networking wise. And you know, you do get your face out there. you get to talk to customers. You get to, you know, hand out bookmarks and whatnot. Yeah. But it's it's really for the connections. Yeah. Speaking of doing stuff like that, have you signed up for Dime Grinds? I don't think so. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I got to hook you up for Dime Grinds. Okay, yeah. Yeah, let me know. We do, we do three authors the first Sunday of every month over at Joe Max Coffee House. The woman who is signing up the, the authors, she's booked already through October. Wow. Yeah. And while book sales don't, I mean, they aren't fabulous. You know, I think when I did it, I think I sold two books. Um, but yeah, it's the connections. It's getting your face and your name and your books in front of people who are not familiar at all. You know, now whether that translates into online sales, like somebody then going out to Amazon and buying the books. I, yeah, I don't know. A lot of times it's that personal connection. I know with uh, Jason, I keep telling him he's got to make it out this way because we do a lot out here. There's there's a lot of festivals. There's a lot of conventions. There's a, a lot of opportunities to have some kind of a book signing or appearance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I really like to do that. There's not a there's not a whole lot out here in in Michigan as as far as that goes. It's not a really it's I don't know. It's it's not really a I don't want to say it's not a creative place, but it's not a not some place people think of as oh I want to go to to meet great artists. So you know I uh, you know I I'd really like to do that. I think that after I get these these next couple books out and in print that that might be a cool thing to do is to be able to to come meet up with you guys out there and and do do some conventions and something like that. I think that'd be fun once I've got some some cool new stuff to offer people. Very cool. So we don't have to lure you in with food, huh? Well, food would still be a good idea. <laughs> hey, that that idea, backyard barbecue and book sales, you you could definitely play with that. I'd, I'd be down. Uh, I'm I'm so much more comfortable in a in a backyard kind of setting than I am in any kind of formal setting. I, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, I that book launch was extremely successful for me. I think I sold around fifty books that night. Oh wow, that is very good. So yeah, I, it turned out really well. So it's like, so for book three, yeah, we're, we're gonna go back to doing the book launch at the house. <laughs> like you, you almost have to be creative at times when it comes to doing that because when you do go to author events that are, are specifically author events, like even the, the Vegas Valley Book Festival, a lot of times, even though we're not competing with each other, there is that element of competition where people will pass your books up to make sure that you know they're going to find what they want first yeah. and once it's out of sight out of mind they may not buy later and so you tend to lose more sales because if they've passed your booth by you're done yeah um even though we're not competing with each other whereas in in circumstances that aren't specifically book related like let's say the comic cons for example sometimes you get a lot of good sales at comic cons because you write something in that fantasy fantasy genre and you're talking to people who actively love anything fantasy. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing I've never tried. Yeah. It, was there anything, Paul, that you wanted to specifically talk about before we end our show tonight? Oh no, just oh my gosh, go to my website, go out to Amazon, mm -hmm. buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> of I course. love the was self promoting. I love it. <laughs> Nathan's Clan of Deadheads available January twenty fourth on Amazon and at the publisher. <laughs> And we'll we'll put up we'll put up links to your website and to the and to the publisher too if you want. And Very cool. Yeah, that'll be awesome. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for another episode of Spilling Ink, the talk show that takes you behind the book to meet the authors and professionals in the publishing world. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Paul. It was great to talk to you. Well, thank you very much. It was a lot of fun to do this. Yes, excellent. And you're going to have to make sure you invite us to your next backyard barbecue and uh, and book sale. Oh, absolutely. You're invited. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I didn't guys. find my own corned beef, by the way. Oh, Ooh. gee, I like it. I like yeah, it. I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Be safe out there and have fun, everybody. We'll see you.